And would you join me in prayer, please? Sovereign Lord, instruct my tongue that I may know the word that sustains the weary. Weaken our ears to listen to your teaching. Amen. Have you ever gotten that phone call or that text or that email and you look at it and you just don't want to answer it? You know what I'm talking about? You know who, the, you know who it's from or you know what it's about and you just don't want to deal with it. Maybe it's a headache from work or maybe it's some turmoil in your family that you just wish would go away. Or maybe that phone call or that text or that email, they're from, you know, that person. The one where no conversation ever ends well. Maybe he'll bores you to death with the minute trivia of his life. Or maybe she has perpetual grievances that she's always talking about. Or maybe that email or that phone call or that text, maybe it's a day of reckoning for you. Because you made a huge blunder and you knew it was only a matter of time before it's going to catch up with you. And now it has. You would just rather avoid it altogether or wish you were already on the other side of it. Have you ever had phone calls or texts or emails like that? Sometimes God calls us. He's the one who's calling us and we don't want to answer it. Now, logically, that's kind of hard to understand that we would respond this way, given what we know about God. Well, well what is it that we do know about God? What, what do we know about God? He loves us. I'm glad that was the first thing he said. What else do we know about God? He cares for us. He forgives us. He has a plan. What's that? Oh, he has jobs for us to do. We're going to hold back on that one. But all the other ones, you would think, well, because God loves us, he forgives us, he has a plan for us, why wouldn't we just be so excited when he calls us and be happy to talk to him about it? Well, it's because what Mary Ray just said. He calls us because there's something he wants us to do. And we don't want to do it. And I think we don't want to do it probably for three reasons. The first reason is we overemphasize our own inadequacies. We don't think that we can do what we actually can do. One of the times I learned this lesson was during our family's first trip to Ghana back in 1997. Uh, my wife and I and our three kids who were pretty little at the time. And so we were in Ghana and um, at one point, one day we visited a teacher training college. And the person who was with us, who was kind of leading us around, we met in the president's office. And so um, Wilson, our friend, and the president of the college, they spoke with each other, but they were speaking in the local language. And we didn't have a clue what they were saying, so I'm kind of daydreaming, looking at the goats walking by in the window outside. And then they're done talking, and Wilson turned to Becky and me and said, okay, well, it's figured out. He's going to have all the students assemble, and you'll have an hour to talk to them. And it's going to start in 10 minutes. And Becky and I were like, oh, gosh, what are we going to do? But you know what? We were able to do it we actually were able to do more than what we thought we could do. And guess what? So can you. So sometimes we don't answer God's call because we overemphasize our inadequacies. Other times we overemphasize the challenges. We look at what's out there and think, my gosh, there's no way it can handle. Look at all the things that could go wrong. Have you ever heard the saying that 99% of our worrying is a waste of time? Because we worry about something, and 90% of the time, what we worry about doesn't even happen. And when it does happen, 90% of the time, it turns out okay. So we can take our worry level and reduce it by 99%. But instead, we look at what could go wrong. The first thing we ask isn't, how is God going to lead me through this? The first thing we ask is, what's going to go wrong? The third reason why we don't want to answer God's call is because we underestimate God's power. And once again, this makes no sense at all. Has God, raise your hand if God has ever done something surprising and amazing in your life. Okay, so he's proved himself to you, right? And if he hasn't done it for you, have you seen, it do, have you seen him do it in other people's lives? Okay, so 
if we know that God can do these amazing, powerful, unexpected things, why in the world would we think that, oh, okay, he's going to stop now. He's not going to do it anymore. We underestimate that. Maybe it's because we can't actually physically see God at work. Maybe it's because it takes work for us to recognize what God is doing. But that doesn't mean he's not there. He is. Or maybe sometimes we underestimate God's power because we need to be practical about things. You know, oh, it's fine to talk about faith and religion and God and everything. But, you know, we just need to be practical about what we're doing. No, we don't. We're people of faith. We're people who say God is going to do what is not possible for us to do. In other words, we're often like Moses when he encountered God in that burning bush, that famous story that Kristen read for us. Moses didn't want to answer for the exact same reasons. First of all, he didn't think that he was up for the job. Moses, at this point in his life, was a murderer on the run. He had been living in Egypt, and he had a privileged life, and he saw an Egyptian slave driver beating one of his fellow Israelites, and he murdered the man. And let's just say it blew up in his face. And so he fled from Egypt as far as ways as he could go, to as remote a territory as possible. And not only did he go off into the wilderness of Midian, but when he met the burning bush, not only was he in the wilderness, but if you listen carefully to what Christian read, he was at the far side of the wilderness. He got away as far as he could possibly get. And then when God says, I'm sending you, you know what Moses did? Did he say, yes, Lord, here I am. Now he started arguing with God. Let me tell you, arguing with God is never a good idea. He's always going to win. And Moses said, well, God, I can't do it. I'm a poor speaker. In other words, I'm not good enough to do this. When Moses met God at the burning bush, he had given up on himself. But God refused to give up on Moses. And you know what? God refuses to give up on you. Whatever it is that you feel you're not up to, whatever it is you feel like you have to run away from and have nothing to do with, God refuses to give up on you. The second reason why Moses didn't want to answer God's call is because he thought, this job is too big for me to do. And that's easy to understand. For centuries, the Hebrews had been enslaved by the Egyptians, and Egypt was the greatest empire in the world. And what was going on at this point was the Egyptians were practicing what you could almost call semi-genocide. They didn't want to completely wipe out the Hebrews because they were slaves. They were Doing work for the Egyptians, that was helpful, but they didn't want there to be too many of them. So they selectively killed off babies to control their population. When you're up against people who are doing things like this, and you're all by yourself, or at least you think you're all by yourself, you can understand why you think the job is too big, can't you? The third reason why Moses didn't answer the call, and the third reason why sometimes we don't, is because he didn't recognize God. He did not see the extent of God's power. And again, at this point, it was easy for Moses to overlook God's presence at all. Yes, Moses personally had miraculously been rescued from the Egyptians murdering the baby boys. Do you remember that story where his mother hid him and then we got too old, put him in a basket and sent him down on the Nile River and then Pharaoh's daughter found him? That was God at work, right? Or was it coincidence? So often, God is at work, and we just think, oh, well, isn't it great things worked out that way? No, isn't it great that God worked things out that way? But Moses didn't see God. Moses didn't recognize God because God's acts of mercy and guidance and for his people were long in the past, generations ago. And in the same way, it is easy for us to overlook or to explain away God's power in our lives. Now, as God is talking with Moses, there is a little bit of a tension or an apparent contradiction in what God said. In verse 8, he told Moses, I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians. So that means God's going to do it, right? But then in verse 10, he says, so now go, I'm sending you to do it. 
Which is it? Is God going to do it or is Moses going to do it? I hear some mumblings, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing what you're saying is God is going to do it, but he's going to do it through Moses, right? Is that what you're mumbling? That's what I thought. God will rescue the people, but he does so by equipping and guiding and accompanying Moses in order to be the one to do it. God took Moses' passion, because Moses was passionate about his people being enslaved. That's why he murdered the slave driver. But God took that passion and redirected it for positive work. Instead of being a murderer, being a deliverer. Sometimes we don't see that God is calling us to do it. When we think, or when we think God is calling us to do it, we're thinking it's all up to us. And we forget this little verse 8 and verse 10 thing. When God says, I'm sending you, he's saying, I'm doing it. I'm going to do it through you. Now, in the New Testament reading that we read together, the Apostle Paul was similarly reluctant to answer God's call. Although reluctance is probably an understatement. Because Paul was in the process of being the one doing the oppressing and the persecuting. He was kind of in the position of the Egyptian slave drivers when God called him. And sometimes I have to wonder, why was it that Paul was so zealous or so energetic or so fired up about persecuting these people who claimed that Jesus was the Messiah, the, that he had risen from the dead. It might be that Paul had an inner turmoil going on within himself. And sometimes when that happens, what we'll do, the psychologists will say, we externalize the conflict. And we look at another person out there who embodies that part of ourselves that we're fighting against, and we fight against them instead of having the battle within ourselves. That, I think, is part of what happened to Paul when God called him and said, I'm sending you. He said the exact same words, I am sending you to both Moses and to Paul. He didn't say, I would invite you to go talk to the Egyptians, or would you please become my spokesperson and spread the gospel to the Gentiles? He didn't ask them. He didn't invite them. He said, this is what I'm doing. Moses and Paul had no choice but to respond when God called them. So why would you think you have a choice? Jesus said to Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Does anyone know what a goad is? It's, a, it's like a cattle prod. It's got, we have enough people with farming in your background. You know what a cattle prod is, right? You poke them along. And if the cow or mule or horse or whatever doesn't move along, and I know that's cruel, you don't do this to the animal. You don't do this to your animals, do you, shall we? No. But if they don't move along, you give them a little bit more of a swat on the butt or poke them a little bit harder to move along. Sometimes when God is saying, I'm sending you, maybe it's not so much a cow as a mule, because they're known to be rather stubborn. And God says, I'm sending you. He said, no, you're not. And we brace our feet and we say, we're not going anywhere. God says, why are you doing this? You're kicking against the goads. You're, you're fighting me. And you're only hurting yourself when you're doing it. So when Jesus says to us, I am sending you, we might be reluctant like Moses was and Paul was. But the truth is, we all have a role to play in what God is doing in this world. God sent Moses to Egypt because the people there were under oppression. Everyone, in some way, needs to be rescued from oppression today because oppression comes in all sorts of shapes and sorts. And no one can rescue people from oppression the way you can. Do you believe me when I say that? No one can do it the way you can. It's the truth. Oh, other people can do it in different ways, but no one can do it the way you can because God has created you as a unique person. You possess within yourself a unique part of God's image. And that means you can do something no one else can do. Now, God's call to you might be come to you in some big spectacular way like it did for Moses at the burning bush or Paul when he saw that flash of light on the roadside. More likely or more often, God's call might be more like this quiet, gentle urging along that you feel. 
And maybe God's call for you means that you're going to change thousands of people's lives like Moses did and Paul did. Or maybe God's call is for you to change a handful of lives of the people who are closest to you. So God is saying, I'm sending you. Why should you answer that call? You should answer it because it benefits you, it benefits God, and it benefits other people. First of all, answering the call benefits you. I mean, let's start with ourselves because we're kind of inherently selfish. What's in it for me? You will never know real satisfaction and purpose until you answer God's call for you. You might feel right now as though you are Moses herding sheep off in a far country. Nothing wrong against herding sheep. Sheep are wonderful. We need shepherds. But maybe you have distanced yourself and gone to the farthest end of the wilderness to get away from it. And you might be trying to fill that void you feel in your life with all sorts of other things. And the other things that you might try to make your life feel good, they might be enjoyable things. They might be good things. But they are not the kind of things you can build your life around. It is only when you are living your calling from God that you really come to life. It's no wonder that Rick Warren made a name for himself with that popular book, The Purpose Driven Life. Just that title, I'm sure, caught people because we want to know what purpose or meaning we have in our lives. And that purpose, and I'm sure the book says the exact same thing, is responding to God's call. Because life is, well, lifeless until we respond to that call. So responding to God's call benefits us. It also benefits God. You think, well, why does God need the benefit? God has a plan for this creation of his. God has a plan for every single one of the precious people that he has created in his image. For every single person he has known since the world began. For every single person that he held in love when he went to the cross to set us free. Every single person that he has prepared a place for is in his eternal home. He has a place. He has a plan for every single person. Now, of course, he's God. He can do whatever he wants, right? But there's a difference between being able to do something and wanting to do something. God doesn't need our help to fulfill his plan, but he wants us to be part of that. And the reason for that is pretty simple. God's desire for us is not to be passive recipients of his love. God wants us to be active participants in what he is doing. And we cannot take part in God's plan until we answer that call. Finally, answering God's call benefits other people. Take Moses as an example. While he was out in the wilderness arguing with a tree on a mountainside in the wilderness, people were suffering and dying under the whip of the Egyptians. Until Moses got on board, they would continue to suffer. In the same way, there are people who are suffering right now, even if they are not in bondage as slaves. Although there are a lot of people in bondage as slaves today, by the way. But suffering comes in many forms. There are people who are suffering physically. There are people who are suffering spiritually. There are people who are suffering in the relationships in their lives. There are people who are suffering economically. There are people who are suffering emotionally and mentally and in so many other ways. And they will continue to suffer until guess what? Until we answer the call. And we take our part in the work that God is doing. So friends, God is calling you. He's calling each of us. Are you going to answer the call? Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for your love. Even when it challenges us and pushes us and leads us where we really don't think we want to go. Help us, Lord, to recognize the way in which you have gifted each of us. Help us to recognize that there are no circumstances that are greater than what you can do. And help us to recognize your presence and your power in our lives. 
as we seek to understand what we can be doing to fulfill your plan of love and mercy and redemption for the people that you love. Amen.